that we have this many people that have come back. <laughs> Pastor Jerome got up and said that people just had to endure my preaching. It was something like that's what you said. Right? But anyway, this may not be one of those things that makes you run the aisles, but this is something that is in short supply today. And one of the scriptures that I've used a number of times, I think every time I've ministered is uh, Psalms chapter 36, verse one, that says the transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. And this is the reason that our nation is messed up today is because people used to have a fear of God. Even people that weren't born again at least had a fear of God. And I defined fear. I spent quite a bit of time doing this. I'm not talking about a terror or a dread, but rather an awe, a respect, an honor. You know, I was thinking about this last night. Let me just give you the story before I get into these scriptures. But when I was in um, the army, it was a bad time. It was during the Vietnam War. And I mean, they would just draft anybody. If you were alive, they would take you. And we had some rough characters. And I remember in my basic training at Fort Bliss, um, El Paso, Texas, which was the worst misnomer in the history of the world. But anyway, Fort Bliss, uh, the very first day they had us together and they asked everybody what they did, you know, uh, before they got drafted. And this one guy, he was a black man, he said, uh, I was a pimp. And the trainee field, I mean, the field sergeant was such an ungodly guy. He hated God. He cursed God. And he says, if there's a God, come strike me dead. And he hated God and anybody associated with God. He chose this guy to be the trainee field sergeant just because he was a pimp. He says, you're my kind of guy. So anyway, I got to witness to this pimp and turned out that his dad was a Southern Baptist preacher. And even though he wasn't born again and he wasn't serving the Lord, he knew that what he was doing was wrong. And he knew that there was a God and he respected me. He honored me. The fear of the Lord is what I believe the scripture terminology would be. He had a fear of God and he honored me. And uh, we had a race riot. We had this uh, barracks that was 50 on one side and 50 on the other side and the latrines were in the middle. And so there was 100 people in this one barracks. But on my side, there was 50 and there was probably 10 or 15 maximum white guys. The rest were black guys in there. And we had a race ride, and I mean, they actually killed, the, the blacks actually killed one of the whites, took an entrench into a while he was asleep and beat this guy, caved his face in and killed him. And there was a lot of animosity going on among the races, and they had a race ride, and they blocked the doors. And they uh, started dragging the white guys out one at a time and beating their heads on the floor. It was concrete floor. And we had a drain in the middle. And the drain, there was so much blood, it clogged up the drain. And you could slosh through the blood in the thing. And anyway, they, they blocked the doors. There was no way to escape. And they just took the white guys one at a time and started beating them. Sent every single one to the infirmary except me. And when he got to me, he was the guy that was leading this whole thing. He got to me. I'm not a fighter. And if I was a fighter, I couldn't have overcome 35 guys. And so I was just laying there praying. And anyway, he grabbed me and pulled me up like this. And when he saw me, he just threw me back on my bed and he fell over on his bed. And that was the end of it. And did you know that this guy who was the pimp became my protector? And if anybody messed with me, they had to go through duck was this guy's name. And God used a pimp to protect me. It was something else. We became friends. I remember one time I walked out and he was just using profanity and he saw me and he says, oh, I'm sorry, preacher. And I said, hey, if you don't mind saying it in front of God, don't feel bad about saying it in front of me. But anyway, my point is, see, he didn't know the Lord, but he had a fear of God, a reverence of God. And there used to be, a, even among people that didn't know the Lord, they knew that God existed. But our society today has gotten so far away from God that people will go in and have school shootings and kill people, and then they'll kill themselves thinking that they got by with it, that they didn't get caught not even realizing that they just ushered themselves into a eternity separate from the Lord. 
See, and used to, we had guns before. Matter of fact, I gave this illustration the other night, but there was a man who was older, and he said when he was young, every single kid in the school brought a gun with them. They had to for protection because they rode for hours on a horse and stuff. And they had guns and nobody got hurt because there was a fear of God that restrained people. But when you lose the fear of God, there's no way to keep people living together without a fear of God, a reverence for God, a standard of right and wrong. And when you lose that, there's just not enough laws. There's not enough policemen. There's not enough things to keep things together. And so we have a lack of fear of God, a lack of reverencing and honoring God. And, and uh, yesterday morning, I shared that the fear of the Lord, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth, talking about a lying tongue, do I hate. If you don't hate evil, then you do not have a fear of God, a reverence for God. You honor God more, you honor people more than you honor God. And so that's where I want to take up today talking about this. And I want to use Daniel and his three friends as an example. Of course, they were in a situation where Nebuchadnezzar made this image of gold and commanded everybody to fall down and worship this image as God when they heard the music. And so here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee... Worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Man, that is an example of fearing God. They honored God more than they honored people. And he said, we aren't careful to answer you in this. That means that we aren't afraid. We aren't shy. They weren't timid. They boldly stood up. And did you know this not only happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and of course we know the results of this was that they were delivered from the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar wound up making a decree that everybody had to honor the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm not sure that all of them truly converted and worshiped God, but they started having a fear of God, a reverence of God because of they, they saw his power demonstrated. And then Daniel in the sixth chapter in verse three, it says that Darius thought to promote Daniel over the entire realm because there was in him an excellent spirit. I've got a teaching on that, how to have an excellent spirit. And that's one of the main scriptures that I use. But Daniel is a man who stood firm and refused to compromise. And so the people were envious of him. They didn't want Daniel ruling over them. So they said, we aren't going to find any occasion against Daniel unless we find it concerning his God. In other words, he was a man who had so much integrity that they couldn't find any skeletons in his closet. They said, if we are going to trip him up, it's going to have to be over his worship of the Lord. And so what they did, they came to Darius and told him to make a decree that for 30 days, nobody could pray to another God or ask any petition of any God except for Darius. That gives you quite a bit of inroad about our insight about who Darius was because he agreed to it that nobody could pray to any God but him for 30 days. And so anyway, he signed this petition and even though he was favorable towards Daniel, uh, he didn't think about that. And Daniel, when this decree was given, look at this in Daniel chapter six, verse 10, it says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. So this wasn't something he did not knowing what the potential consequences could be. When he knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So it makes special mention of the fact that he left his windows open. Did you know he could have prayed with his windows closed? He didn't have to do this to be able to contact God. You don't have to be kneeling down. You don't have to be facing a certain direction. You don't have to go through all these religious things. He could have contacted God and have just kept it quiet, such as 
uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They could have kneeled. God would have still loved them. But you know what? They refused to do that. They honored God more than they honored men. They feared God more than they feared what men could do unto them. And because of it, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wound up turning the entire situation around. You know, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Daniel chapter 4. And most people aren't aware of this, but did you know it's the only chapter in the Bible that a pagan king wrote? Nebuchadnezzar wrote the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. And he did it specifically to say that I want to give honor unto the Lord. He wanted to fear God and let it be known. And he talked about how that he became like an animal. He had these dreams, and I won't spend time to go through it, but Daniel interpreted the dream to him. And in the dream, he would become an animal for seven years. He would lose his mind. He would live outside with no clothes on. His hair would become like fur. His fingernails became like claws and he ate grass. The man who was the mightiest ruler on the planet became like an animal and for seven years ate grass. And then after seven years, his memory, his mind came back unto him and he humbled himself and he says, now I know that God rules over the affairs of men and sets the basis of men in control. And I want to give honor and glory. And so he wrote the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. You ought to go read it. And the last verse of that chapter is one of my favorite verses where he says, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Wow. <laughs> what an understatement. Able to abase, make you an animal for seven years. And so anyway, these are people that had a fear of God. And they said, we aren't careful to answer you. We aren't afraid. We aren't worried about what you do. You can't do anything to us. You know, all they can do is kill us. That's the worst thing that could happen. Amen. Not many amens on that. <laughs> But what happens if they kill you? You go to be with Jesus and live in a mansion forever on streets of gold. And, you know, I was talking to Joanne, the lady who came up here last night, and uh, Pastor Jerome was uh, called her out, and she had, her husband just died on Friday. And I was talking to her this morning, and, and she was talking about, man, she believes that her husband just saw the other side and didn't want to come back. I tell you, heaven is awesome. When we get there, we're going to wonder why we fought so hard to stay here because heaven is great. If you would think, if you had a fear of God, if we really honored God and respected and trusted him, all of the things that I've been talking about in this series, you know what? You'd be to a place to where, what can they do? Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So what do you do to a person who doesn't mind dying? He said, I'd rather be with Christ. I'd rather be there. How do you intimidate a guy like that? Say, quit preaching or we'll kill you. And he says, man, shoot your best shot, amen. <laughs> like, no problem. You can't intimidate a person like that. These people had a relationship with God. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually had their bondages burned off and they were walking around freely in the fire with the fourth man that looked like the son of God is what Nebuchadnezzar said. I believe it was Jesus. Did you know what? They didn't come running out of the fire as soon as they got free. They were having a great time in the fire. They were in there visiting with Jesus, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. It's not so bad. They had to be called to come out of the fire. Man, if we would think right, if we would honor God, what's more important in our relationship with God? We're worried about people criticizing us, saying something about us, rolling their eyes, calling you a fanatic. I'll tell you, that's, that's, that's not a fear of God. We need to honor God. We need to love him so much that it doesn't matter what other people say about us. You know, this example I was given about being in the military, this ungodly commander that appointed this man named Duck as the trainee field sergeant. I told him one Sunday he wanted to put me on KP duty, and I said, you know, I want to go to chapel. And he said, chapel, and he began to start cussing, and he stood up and blasphemed God and said, if there's a God, strike me dead right now. And when nothing happened, he said, see, there's no God. 
I didn't have the boldness to tell him back then, but I thought to myself, I said, that's like a grasshopper standing on a railroad track and saying, if there's a rail, if there's a train, then come out here and run me over. Why would they dispatch a train to come all the way out there and run over a grasshopper? <laughs> Why would God go to the effort of striking that guy dead? Didn't even give him the time of day. But anyway, this guy hated me so much. He called me preacher and he would have me saying, you know, we would do physical training and things, but then one uh, in the afternoons, it was hot in um, El Paso, Texas. And so in the afternoons, we'd come inside and they'd do classes and train us on things. And he would have me stand at attention and have people come up and tell the dirtiest joke that they could or what they did over the weekend with their past going out and raping girls or having sex with prostitutes and they'd describe it in detail while I stood at attention. And he'd say, you hate me, don't you, preacher? And I said, no, sir, I'm praying for you. And you know what? It turned out to be awesome. I got to witness to every person in my deal. I led a bunch of them to the Lord. It was just great. And yet there's a lot of people that wouldn't stand up because somebody was making fun of you or doing something like that. That's not the fear of God. The truth is most people, and I'm talking about most Christians, and sad to say I believe probably a lot. Of, I know this is Saturday morning. You're the fanatics. And yet there's a lot of you in here that you won't even stand up at the water cooler at work. They'll be talking about abortion, killing babies, whatever it is, transgenderism, which I love those people, but it's a deadly lifestyle. It's ungodly and you won't stand up and you won't say anything because somebody will roll their eyes at you. You don't fear God. You fear men more than you fear God. I'm not mad at you. God's not mad at you. He loves you, but I'm telling you, that is not a fear of God. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are examples of people that had a fear of God. And I can testify that when you stand up and when you stand for what's right, it causes a fear in those people. I'm not sure that I'm going to get to it. I'm on page seven and I got 17 pages of, of scriptures here. So I probably am not going to make it, but there are scriptures that talk about that God made the fear of David fall upon these people. And God puts a fear of you, not a fear in the sense of terror or dread, but a respect. If you stand up to the devil, you will be persecuted. The Bible says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. If you aren't being persecuted, it's because you aren't godly. Anybody miss that? <laughs> if you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. If you live a godly life, people are going to persecute you and say something against you. And so, yes, there is going to be persecution, but... There will also be respect. There are people that in their heart, they know what's right and they will respect you for standing up. You know, when I was in the ninth grade, there was this guy, I won't call his name because somebody might know him. But anyway, he had failed two or three grades. So he was two or three years older than anybody else. And uh, he was a bully and he'd go around and just beat people up. And I remember one day I was walking by and he was beating up on the scrawniest kid in the school. I mean the weakest kid in the school. And I just walked up to him and I said, stop it. And he looked at me like, what are you going to do about it? And I said, I'm not going to let you do this. And I, he said, I'm going to beat you up. And I said, you probably will because I've never been a fighter in my life. But I said, it's still wrong. And I said, if you beat me up, you're gonna, you're, I'm going to fight you. It's wrong what you're doing. I stood up to the bully. And you know what? He respected me for it. And this guy, the bully, the bad guy, he was my protector in the ninth grade. If anybody ever got to me, they had to go through this guy. I've seen this happen time and time and time again. There was an instance, you know, I'm telling war stories now, but there was an instance when I went up to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and anyway, I had a driving course where I had to take a course on driving a Jeep. I was a chaplain's assistant, was my MOS. And so I had to learn how to drive a Jeep. And anyway, I missed the test, and so they put me with this other group and the very first day I was with them we were in this um, uh, 10 by 10 uh, where uh, stairs went down 
to an entrance into a building and we were down there huddled because we didn't have any field jackets. We were just wearing fatigues and it was cold in New England, New Jersey. And uh, it was in, I think, November and it was cold. And we were, there was about 20 of us in this 10 by 10 spot just trying to stay warm, waiting on them to open up and get our paychecks. I'd never met any of these people before. I, I hadn't been with them. And anyway, we were down there and they were just cussing and blaspheming God and doing things. And I was praying, oh, Jesus, give me an opportunity. Help me to say something. And about the time I prayed that, this guy goes, this is no way for a good old Schofield carrying Baptist to talk. And as soon as he said, I mean, it just was nearly instantaneously when I prayed, give me an opportunity. And it just came out of my mouth. I said, you got a Schofield Bible? And he goes, yeah, do you? And I said, I sure do. I said, you ought to read yours sometime. <laughs> and he says, what do you mean? I said, haven't you ever read the scripture that every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment for by your words, you shall be justified and by your words, you shall be condemned. And man, he started pushing his way through there and he was taller than me and he got right up to me. And I said, one other verse, it says in Galatians chapter four, verse 16, it says, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? <laughs> and he just stopped and turned his back. And for the next 15, 20 minutes, not a word was said. We just all stood there. And it turned out they put me in with that group. And for the next eight weeks, those were my uh, fellow soldiers. We went through things. And I would walk into the barracks and everybody would be talking and they'd see me and everybody shh, and they wouldn't say a word. I'd go sit down and they'd all pick up their stuff and they'd leave. I never had a person talk to me for eight weeks. They treated me like the plague. They would have, I'd walk into a room and everybody would leave. But yeah, I thought it was great because I didn't have to listen to all of their unbelief. And finally, it was right before Christmas we were getting ready to uh, go on our Christmas leave and I would always go into the kiddies section where the uh, things were and the other guys would go look at the pornography and stuff and I'd go over there and I'd sit there and read my New Testament. And this man came walking around the corner and saw me and stopped and he started to leave and then he turned around and he says, Womack, you don't think I'm a Christian, do you? And I said, I don't know if you're a Christian or not, but I said, if I was a fruit inspector, there's not enough evidence to convict you. <laughs> I said, there's no evidence. I've been praying for you. And he started crying and he says, I've been in gospel singing groups. I sang with the happy good Goodmans. He says, I've, I've been traveled the world doing things. And he says, I'm a Christian. I know better than this. And he started crying and he says, how do I get right with God? And anyway, I told him, I said, well, I'll tell you, uh, as soon as we get back from our Christmas leave, we left within an hour or two for Christmas leave. And when we got back, he's the only one out of my whole class that didn't get sent to Vietnam. He got sent to Germany. And so I didn't hear from him. And it was like 20 something years later, he saw me on television and he was in another room and he heard my voice. And he came out of the room and he says, I know that guy. And he came to my meeting and he's now an Assembly of God pastor in Tennessee. And it changed his life. So anyway, I'm just saying that, you know what? You, there are people that don't even know the Lord. They, they aren't right with God, but in their heart, they know it's right. And if Christians would stand up and speak the truth, there would be a fear of God, a fear of you. Not a fear in the sense of terror or dread, but a respect. And it would work out to your advantage every single time, every single time. You know, the scripture says that the fear of man brings a snare. That's Proverbs chapter 29. I believe it's verse 25. But anyway, the fear of man brings a snare, but he, whoever puts his trust in the Lord uh, shall be safe. And when you are trusting in God, there the word fear of God and trust is used interchangeably. If you are afraid of people and afraid of standing up and speaking the truth, it's because you actually trust in men. You believe that you are more afraid of them and what they will do than you are of what God will do. And I'm telling you, that's an ungodly attitude. 
I could stay on that the rest of the time. Let me use, move on to some other scriptures that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalms chapter 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. If you seem to struggle to understand things, it's because you don't fear God. It's because you've exalted man's opinion and values instead of what God says. I had a woman come up to me and say that she had been reading the Bible uh, because she'd been listening to my stuff and she heard my teaching on effortless change. She'd been reading the Bible and she said it had changed everything and that the Bible had just come alive to her. I'm telling you that the way the world thinks is absolutely crazy. Amen. Thank you for that one amen. Amen. This world has absolutely lost their mind. It is crazy. They don't even know which bathroom to go into. <laughs> How confused can you possibly be? You know, 10 years ago, nobody would have thought that this would have been popular. And yet this inclusion stuff, I had a guy come to me who's in the corporate world and he said, this is the biggest thing in the corporate world. They're having all of this training on inclusion and you have to embrace all of these different lifestyles. They now, I've, I've heard the number, I forget now what it is, but there's over 50, I think it was 50 or 60 different genders that they have isolated. How dumb can you get and still breathe? That is just, that's dumb to the second power. That's dumb, dumb. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. When you begin to start fearing God and take the instructions in the word, it changes the way you think. All of a sudden you have great understanding is what it says. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Man, that's awesome. Did you know that our schools in this nation were founded on the word of God? They actually started schools because they wanted Christians to be able to read and understand. And they taught the word of God in our schools. Did you know that Yale, Harvard, Princeton, every one of those were started as theological schools. Harvard, if you didn't attend chapel, if you didn't do daily Bible readings, you could not be a student. It was mandatory. It was all based on the word of God. And now these higher education things are the strongest stronghold of liberal thinking and anti-God thinking that there is. But people used to understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There is no knowledge that is true knowledge apart from the word of God. If it violates the word of God, it's wrong. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. People that don't have knowledge of God don't have any understanding. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. And we could go on and on. How many scriptures do you need to show that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge? The sad thing is very few people let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They're going to believe it and they don't care what the Bible says. If you believe the Bible, this is saying that there is no knowledge or wisdom or understanding apart from God. A person who doesn't know God is crazy. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 30. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Did you know most people don't believe that today? Man, we honor people that have degrees. You could have 32 degrees and still be frozen. That doesn't mean that you are anybody special. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. In Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, in Psalms chapter 53, verse 1, these are identical. Those Psalms are nearly identical, just a few words different. And in, it says, 
the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. This was quoted in Romans chapter 3. Matter of fact, the entire psalm was quoted in Romans chapter 3, and it ends by saying that they have no fear of God. People that don't fear God are fools. And I know that that's not politically correct. And some of you, I can't believe that you're saying stuff like this. I'm quoting the Bible to you. <laughs> the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's crazy. Do you know, you could take all of the cumulative power of mankind. You could take all of our resources, every, every smart person that we have, and they couldn't create one blade of grass. They could create something that might look like grass, feel like grass, but it'll never reproduce and produce another blade of grass. Mankind in all of his ability, the cumulative power of over 7 billion people on this planet can't produce one single blade of grass. They can't produce a single leaf. They can produce things that might look like it. You know, these pictures that we had up here behind us as we were singing, man, it was just beautiful. And yet people can't figure out that God did that. And yet they, they send a spacecraft to Mars and if they find the slightest little wiggle in a rock, that, that's a sign that this, this was some worm or something. There was life on Mars. They are grasping at straws and looking for things and they're looking for life and all of these things. But yet you've got all of this complexity of our world that we've got and they can't figure out that there's a God. That's absolutely foolish. Look at these verses in Psalms chapter 19 in verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout all of the earth, and their works words to the end of the world in them hath he, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun in that verse one the word that was translated declare the heavens declare the glory of god that word means here's what the greek word means to score with a mark as a tally or record to inscribe also to enumerate intensive to recount celebrate god has marked everything in this world Everything in this world is just shouting out. That word that, where it says it showeth the handiwork of God, that word showeth means to front, that is to stand boldly out opposite. By implication, to manifest, to announce, to expose, predict, explain, praise. Man, creation is shouting out every single day. Creation is just saying that there is a God and yet some of the people that we revere the most and have the most clout and influence are people that cannot even see that there is a God. Again, that is absolutely foolish. You know, I go walking a lot and out in our place, I, just across the road from us, uh, there's this forest and I was walking through there one day and I came on a bunch of... Uh, uh, logs that had been uh, cut, they were squared, and they were on top of rocks. And you could tell as I looked at it, it was the frame of some building from back in the 1800s or something like that. And I looked at that and I thought, man, you know, this is proof that somebody at some time or another built some kind of a dwelling here, just some rocks laying there and a few cut logs on it. And that's not alive. That's not something that can reproduce. That is nothing compared to creation. And yet, if a person just walked through the woods and saw a few rocks piled up and some cut logs on them and they formed a perfect rectangle, you would be considered an absolute fool if you said, look what evolved. I wonder how these logs were cut exactly, how they were stacked, how these rocks were put. How, did the, how many millions of years did this take to happen? You're an absolute fool if you believe that. That's crazy. And yet you can look at the complexity. 
you know, if we were to land on the moon, and let's just say that you found a house that was built, and it had air conditioning, and it had a bed and rooms and a bathroom, a toilet and stuff, I guarantee you they'd be shouting from the rooftops, this is proof that there is life on the moon. People have been here. You'd be considered an idiot if you said, look what evolved. This house just evolved, air conditioning evolved. And yet none of those things are near as complex as just the human eye. The human eye is impossible. Mankind and all of their ability can't do anything that even approaches a human eye. And yet there's people that we consider to be intellectual and leaders and stuff that are so dumb they can't even see. The heavens are yelling at them every single day they're fools. I love them. I'm not mad at them. But they're fools. God loves you, you fool. Amen. Praise God. Well, I hope you're enduring this. As I said yesterday, you have to have, you have to have a spiritual power that is influencing you to miss creation. It is a demonic spirit. You have to have faith to believe in evolution. Evolution takes more faith than creation. I've heard these statistics that if you had an explosion, if a bomb went off in a a uh, Boeing factory where they had all of the parts of a 747 and if a bomb was to go off, the chances of that bomb causing all of those parts to come together and form a 747 that could fly and work are uh, like a million times easier to happen than evolution. Evolution is statistically impossible. Anything to one to the, I think the 12th power, I took this in college, I was a math major and I took uh, probability and anything one to the 12th power is statistically impossible. Did you know that evolution is one to the trillionth something power and every power is 10 times, like one to the second power is 10 times as much as one to the first power. So every time you increase, it's 10 times. And evolution is statistically impossible. It just can't happen. And yet, I'm saying this in love, but how many people will stand up and say this? We act like we're apologetic. We're apologizing. Man, I'm not the one that needs to feel weird. That's right. That's good. To think that this just happened. You know, I taught on this in one of our summer family Bible conferences and I, I was doing fire mitigation on my property and I've got pictures of this. I doubt that they have them available, but I took pictures of this just to make a point. But you know, fire mitigation is where you cut off all the low hanging limbs that are dead and stuff because fire, if it comes through, it'll burn the grass, but then it, they call it ladder fuel and it'll come up the tree and burn those dead things and it'll catch the whole tree on fire. So you cut off the lower limbs that are dead. So I had these big old trees that just had huge branches at the bottom. I took a picture of them before I did anything. And then after I cut these things up to about 15 feet tall, I cut all of those limbs down, removed them, and I took a picture of it. And I said, if somebody was to walk through my property and see these trees with all of these branches cut off and they were cut off evenly, they weren't broken off, but they were sawed off. And if you walked through there and thought, look what evolution did, you would be considered an idiot. And yet people do this exact same thing with creation. Creation is shouting at us. It's been scored with the mark. God has left a witness to every single person. And if you don't start with what the Word of God says as the foundation of your wisdom and of your knowledge, then according to the Bible, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. I'm not mad at people, but I am saying that I hate that the fact that people are trying to figure out all of these things without God. 
And sad to say, it's transitioned over into the Christian realm. We may not embrace evolution. Well, there's a lot of Christians that embrace evolution, believe in theistic evolution, which is completely contrary to the Word of God. There is no such thing as theistic evolution. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Evolution is built upon cycles of death and rebirth and just year after year, millennia after millennia of death and rebirth. And the Bible makes it clear that by man, one man, sin entered into the world. Talking about Adam, that's Romans chapter 5, I believe verse 14 or 15. Sin entered the world through Adam and there could not have been death prior to that time. Theistic evolution does not comply with Scripture. Amen. Let me move on. Lack of fear of God equals sin. People that do not fear God wind up living in sin. Holiness relates to the fear of God. You can look at a person's life and tell, out, tell whether or not they fear God. Now, I don't believe that you can just look at a person's actions and tell whether they're born again because the Bible says the truth sets you free. You have to know the truth. It's only the truth that you know that you set free. And there's a lot of Christians that do not know the truth. And because of it, they still live in bondage and they're living under deception. And God loves you. And I'm not saying you have to be perfect to have God love you. But I'm saying that if you are living in sin, it's because you don't have a fear of God. You don't honor God. God, you don't honor his word. It says in Genesis chapter 20, verse 11, Abraham was speaking and he said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. This is Abraham saying why he didn't tell people that Sarah was his wife. Because he said, I didn't think there was a fear of God here, that you people were ungodly and that you would kill me in order to get to his wife. You know, he said this when his wife was 70-something years old, and then he did it a second time when she was 90 years old. She was such a good-looking woman that he was afraid somebody had kill him to get to her. Man, Sarah must have been a good-looking lady. In Psalms chapter 36, verse 1, I've quoted this already. It says, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. People that go in and kill other people, people that rob and plunder and do these things that they're doing, it's because they don't have a fear of God. If they had a fear, a reverence, an acknowledgement, an honor of God, whether or not they had committed their life to him or not, I guarantee you, people would not be doing the things that they're doing. And so it's a problem in society. And it always amuses me every time there's a, a shooting or something, they want to come out and start taking away guns. And they're saying that, man, it's because of this, uh, you know, uh, NRA and all of these things. They come out against these things. And the people who are saying these things are the very people who are leading the charge to take the fear of God out of our society. They are pushing killing babies. They are, they are pushing all kinds of transgenderism. They are systematically coming against everything that the Word of God teaches, and yet they claim that they have the answer is to take away guns and to do all this. The problem isn't guns. I've said this the other day, but guns don't make you, don't kill people any more than forks make people fat. The fork doesn't make you fat. It's the person using the fork that makes you fat. It's a, you could take a gun and lay it here on this stage and it'll never kill a person unless some person who doesn't have the fear of God picks it up and starts using it. The fear of God is the only thing that can restrain. You can't put enough laws on people. You can't take enough things away from people if there isn't a fear of God. The fear of God is what we need in this nation, not more laws. Fear of God is what we need. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. 
How clear does it have to get? The fear of the Lord causes men to depart from evil. People that do not depart from evil, people who do evil, it's because they do not have a fear of God. They don't honor God. They don't go by God's standards. They don't even have the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. They've been listening to the lies and the deception of this world instead of the word of God. In verse, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If you have a fear of God, it'll cause you to start living a holy life. And again, I say that sometimes people have heard me preach on grace and they understand that God loves us in spite of our sins and in spite of our failings. And I believe that 100%. But they take grace and they use it as, well, then it's okay. It's okay to go live in sin. It's okay to just do these kind of things. Well, God still loves you. That's not an issue. God is not going to impute sin unto you. He imputed sin unto his son but I guarantee you, sin is an inroad of Satan into your life. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, you are yielding to the person who inspired that sin, the devil. And he comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. If you give Satan inroad into your life, he is going to eat your lunch and pop the bag. You do not want to do that. Amen. But God still loves you. But this says that you perfect. This is a New Testament scripture written by the apostle Paul. He's the one who wrote 2 Corinthians. And he says perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Brothers and sisters, we need to honor God. We need to trust God. We need to respect God. We need to love God more than we love men and their approval. We need to love the truth revealed in his word more than the quote unquote truth that this world is producing, which is absolute foolishness. Man, there's just so much I'd like to say about all of that. I'm trying to refrain myself and be nice. <laughs> Did you know when people see the supernatural power of God in manifestation in your life, it'll cause the fear of God to fall upon them. Joshua chapter 4, verse 23, it says, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which he dried up from before us until we were gone over that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that it is mighty that you might fear the Lord your God forever one of the reasons that there isn't a greater fear of God is because God's people aren't manifesting forth his power and his glory you go to the average church today and you can predict what the service is going to be like. They can print a bulletin two years in advance because the Holy Spirit never intervenes. Nothing ever happens. You don't see any people healed. You know, these people that we had standing up here today, man, this is the power of God and it'll make people honor God and fear God and respect God because these are testimonies to the fact that God is alive and well. We should be glorifying God in our actions in such a way that it causes a fear of God to fall upon other people. They recognize that God is with us. I actually went in for a job interview one time and I told the guy, I said, if you hire me, you'll be blessed. I said, whoever hires me, you'll be blessed. Your whole place will be blessed. I believe that. People ought to recognize that. That's exactly what happened with Jake, uh, Joseph. Joseph, it says that Potiphar's whole household was so blessed from the time that Joseph began to be one of his slaves that he promoted Joseph to be over the entire group. He gave everything to him. He didn't even know what he had. He didn't even know the food that he ate. He gave everything he had to a slave because the fear of God came upon him. He recognized that God was with Joseph. 
Pharaoh saw the same thing. Who can we find that is so discreet as you are? And they promoted him to be the second most powerful man in the nation. He had been in prison that morning and by nightfall, he was the second most powerful man in the nation because of the fear of God, the reverence of God. People saw that God was with him. This will cause people to fear God. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And the sad fact is we haven't been standing up. We've been afraid of men and we haven't been letting our light shine. We haven't been speaking the truth. If every person in here, we have approximately a thousand people here. If every person here was just to take this and start being bold, and I'm not talking about being rude and mean, and I'm talking about just being bold and saying what you believe and, and who cares if people like you or dislike you. But just speak the truth in love. Do it for the purpose of trying to see these people set free by the truth. But regardless of whether they receive it or not, you just stood up. If you were to stand up for the word of God, if a thousand people here went out of here and all were speaking the truth, I guarantee it would impact this area or wherever you came from. But the sad fact is we just got very few people that do it. And it's because you fear men more than you fear God. Praise the Lord. You know what? Someday the United States is going to be gone. I pray that it lasts a long time. God has done a great thing here and we are, we are a, a safeguard to the entire world. And so I'm not praying for the demise of this nation, but someday, if no, nothing else, when the Lord comes back, the United States isn't going to exist. And all of the people who are presenting all of these things are going to be gone and you are going to stand before God Almighty and you are going to give an account of what you've done. And I can guarantee you, you will remember this message. And you will think, why did I fear men more than I feared God? When you see God Almighty and all of his glory and splendor, and then you look over here at this person that used to intimidate you, who is on their face before God confessing that Jesus is Lord. You're going to think, why did I honor these people? Why did I respect them so much? Why was I so afraid of them? You'll wish that you'd been like Daniel that prayed with your windows open. Practice civil disobedience. When he knew that the law was passed, it didn't matter. He was going to honor God and do what God said regardless of what the law said. Amen. Acts chapter 19, it says, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them. This is talking about that people saw Paul casting out demons and so they thought they'd cast out demons and they weren't believers. But they went and they said, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. And it says, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this man was known to all of the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord was magnified. Fear fell upon people when they saw the fact that Paul had authority over demons and these seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, tried to imitate the same thing and they couldn't do it. It's the same thing that happened with Moses. Moses cast his rod down and it became a snake. So the magicians cast their rod down and they became a snake. They could imitate the things of God to a degree, but man, when the boils came, even the magicians had boils upon them and they said, Pharaoh, this is the hand of God. And these very people who had withstood uh, Moses said, you know, let them go. We're all but dead men. The unbelievers began to start respecting and honoring God. A fear of God fell upon them. The same thing would happen today if people who, are, who know the truth would stand up and speak it. The truth is always greater than a lie. You know, another experience, I'm going to wind this up here, but another experience I had when I was in the army was over in Vietnam and I was leading a Bible study. I was a chaplain's assistant. And the, I didn't have a chaplain. They were gone. And so I was doing a Bible study. And I had about six or seven men come to my Bible study. And I forgot now what we were studying. But a guy came in who was a Princeton graduate. 
And he stood there for a little bit and listened. And then he started asking me questions and started attacking everything and saying that there is no God and that the Bible isn't the word of God. And I was just brand new in the Lord. I didn't know very much. And he out talked me and out argued me. And he got up and he says, you're, you're an idiot. And he says, I'm leaving. Who will go with me? And all six or seven of the guys that were in my Bible study left with the atheist. And he walked out. And I was just sitting there thinking, man, that was awesome. <laughs> and I was thinking, God, what could I have done? I said, give me another chance. And while I was praying, this atheist walks back in. It was in a chapel and there was uh, books and things in there. And he walked in and sat down and looked like he was thumbing through a book. And I was praying and saying, oh, God, give me another chance. What could I do? And while I was praying, this guy walks over and he says, I want what you've got. And I was just shocked. I said, why? And he says, my whole life is built on an argument. He said, I out-argued you. I made you look like a fool. You didn't know what you were talking about. And he says, but you've got something that's beyond an argument. You've got a relationship. You know God. One of the things I told him, I said, look, I know there's a God because I talked to him this morning. I said, he talks to me. He says things to me. And he says, I want what you've got. And I was able to lead this guy to the Lord. You know what? The, you could use different words to describe it, but it was a fear of God. He reverenced and respected what he saw in me. He saw that I had something. Every one of us that are born again have something that this world doesn't have. They may have an argument, but a person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. You may not understand everything, but man, if you would just stand up and say, you know, we're a witness. A witness doesn't mean that you're the jury, you're the judge, you're the lawyer. You just witness. What has happened to you? I know that there's a God because he changed my life because I've been healed, because I've been delivered, and you just stand up and share what you have, I guarantee you God will use that to change people's lives. In Acts chapter 5, this is about Ananias and Sapphira. And after they were struck dead because they had lied to the Holy Ghost, Pastor Jerome was dealing with this, or he called it not Sapphira, what would you call her? Sapphira. Shakira. Anyway... It's like Sri Lanka or Sri Lanka or whatever. But anyway, this husband and wife lied to the Holy Ghost. They were struck dead. It says in Acts chapter 5, it says, And great fear came upon all of the church and upon as many as heard these things. I guarantee you, if we were seeing the power of God manifest in our lives and stuff, fear of God would come upon other people. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 43, it says, Hear thou in heaven, this is uh, Solomon praying at the dedication of the temple and saying, God, when people come into this place and pray and ask you for these things, he says, Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people Israel, that they may know that this house which I have built it is called by thy name. Did you know we are supposed to show the fear of the Lord to other people? And here's another thing that most people don't understand, but if you're in leadership, you know, I've got these verses in here someplace. It's in Joshua, I believe, chapter 4. I'd have to look this up. But anyway, the Lord told Joshua that I am going to magnify you in the sight of all of Israel so that they will know that I have, am with you the way that I was with Moses and that my fear might come upon them, that your fear would come upon them. Did you know God will cause a fear to call, come upon the people that he's instructed you to be a leader over? Not a terror, not a dread, not that kind of thing, but an honor and a respect. And if you don't let God magnify you, he says, I'm going to magnify you in the sight of all Israel. Did you come up with that? On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses. If you don't let God magnify you, if you are under a false humility to where you won't let God 
magnify you in the sight of people. It'll, it'll decrease, it'll limit your influence that you have. That's kind of a hard thing to explain in just a few words. But you know, you have to let God be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God wants to magnify you. What Pastor Jerome has been saying, God wants to make us like Abraham and Isaac were, that the unbelievers will come and say, depart from us, you're mightier than we are. And they envied Isaac because of his prosperity. We need to let God magnify us. We need to let his blessings come upon us to such a degree that, man, people look at us and they say, there's something different about you. And they go to fearing and reverencing God. But I guarantee if the average Christian was arrested for being a Christian today, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. You're as sick as your neighbor. You're as poor as your neighbor. You're as mad, as upset, as depressed, as discouraged. I often will give an invitation and say people that are fighting discouragement stand up. And it's not unusual to have a crowd like this. 80 to 90% of spirit-filled Christians stand up and they're fighting depression. That should not be. Now, God loves you. And praise God, there is deliverance from that. But I'm saying it shouldn't be that way. And yet most Christians aren't appropriating what God has for them. There isn't any manifestation of God. We should be, we should stand out like a healed thumb. We're alive. They're dead. You ought to be able to tell the difference between a dead and an alive person. Yet you could go into the average church today and if somebody died, you called 911, they'd have to take out half the crowd before they found the dead person. <laughs> In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, uh, thou and thy son and thy son's sons all the days of thy life that thy days may be prolonged. Right here it says that the word of God will teach you the fear of the Lord. If you don't have a fear of God, if you struggle with being intimidated and not free to share the truth because of what other people might think. It's because you haven't spent much time in the Word of God. The Word of God will teach you a fear of God. You'll see what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with Daniel, with Moses, and on and on you could go, Joseph and David and all of these things. And you know what? It'll teach you to fear God and exalt his opinion above man's opinion. If you have a fear of man, if you, are un, if you are afraid to stand up and be a bold witness and declare the truth, it's because you haven't spent much time in the Word. You've spent more time in the light of your TV than you've sent, spent in the light of the Word. Amen or oh me. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13 says that thou, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and swear by his name. You know, if you go back to that Deuteronomy 6 2, it says one of the benefits of fearing the Lord is that your days will be prolonged. Today, people are looking for, to extend their life. And people spend huge amount of money on food and exercise and things like this. And there's a place for that. We do have a physical body, and if you put trash in it, it's going to affect things. And so I'm not saying that you totally ignore this, but the Bible teaches that spiritual things are much more important than all of these physical things. There is a place for it, but you know, it says that if you honor your father and mother, you'll live long upon the life. It didn't mention anything about your diet. It says that a merry heart does good like a medicine. It says in Psalms chapter 34 that if we take the word of God and meditate in it, it will prolong our life. It'll be health to our navel and marrow to our bones. On and on you could go. There are so many scriptures that talk about fearing God will prolong our life. And people are putting huge amount of effort into physical, natural things, which again, have a place. It's a part of the equation. This is just andiology, but my thoughts are it's 20 or 30 percent of your health is related to diet and exercise. But spiritual things are much, 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 much more important. 
You know, I read a survey about they went over to Japan and studied those people because they have the lowest heart uh, problems of any developed country. So they studied their diet and what they did and they found out that they eat a huge amount of fish and so they really promote fish oil and omega-3s and things like this. And they said that's the reason that they live so long. And the first thing I thought of is that the Japanese honor their parents to such a degree that they worship them. Now, I think that that's overboard. That's not what we're supposed to do. But I mean, you talk about a culture that honors parents, it's the Japanese. And I believe that there is a direct relationship between them honoring their parents and living a long life. Did you know when they had the tsunamis over there and all of this stuff happened, in America, there would have been looting. It would have been a serious problem. They virtually had zero looting in Japan after the tsunamis. You know why? Because they have a culture that is built on honor. Man, they bow and respect people. And of course, it's not all perfect and they aren't, they need Jesus like anybody else. But I'm talking about, you talk about a culture of honor and respecting their elders and respecting the gray hair scripture I used yesterday. They have it. And as a result, they don't have some of the problems that other people do. I'm not saying that we don't take care of our bodies, but I'm saying that that Christians have gotten to where they think everything is organic. They think it's all natural. They think that if you, if you're a, a kleptomaniac, that it's somehow or another a problem in the genes. No, it's the person that's in the genes. That's the problem. Well, I, I can't help. I'm an alcoholic because I've got a predisposition to it. No, it's because you're making wrong decisions. I've had people before say, well, I'm fat. I just can't lose weight. Yes, you can. Quit eating and you'll lose weight. I can guarantee it 100%. Amen. I just look at food and gain weight. That's not true. I can't help it. Since you were a little kid, you've been feeding yourself. Nobody else has been feeding you. You can help it. I had my nephew one time. I was riding with him, and he was saying, I've got two tickets for going fast. If I get another one, I lose my license. He said, would you pray for me that I won't lose my license? And I said, I can't pray that you won't lose your license. I said, quit speeding. He says, I can't. I just can't do it. And I stuck my finger up to his head and I said, if this was a gun and if I'm looking at the speedometer and if you go 56 in a 55 mile an hour zone, I'm going to pull the trigger. I said, could you drive the speed limit? He said, I could do it. <laughs> and I said, see, you can do it. You just lack motivation. <laughs> you can quit overeating. You can quit whatever. <laughs> And you know what? When I minister like this, I'll have Christians get, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I forgot. I was supposed to be through 20 minutes ago. <laughs> All right, I'm quitting. <laughs> Forgive me, Pastor Jerome. I, I did this to Creflo Dollar, too. <laughs> I preached right through Creflo Dollar's time one time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I repeat. 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 I'm sorry. And I mean, just instantly, within an hour or two of her being healed, he was talking about how that this happened because somebody sent a free tape to England that sat there for 15 years in a drawer. And it was that free tape that our partners sent that caused his daughter to be healed. And then our website had all of our things free. And Ashley has always been appreciative of that. And I tell you, every one of you who are partners with this ministry, you don't understand how much you are enabling us to do. But we are touching people all over the world. And every one of you who's a partner, you, you've got a part in that. People are going to come up in heaven and actually thank you for the impact that you've made in their life. That is not an exaggeration. That's not something we just say for an offering. You are making a difference. We couldn't do what we're doing. You know, every person's life that's being changed this week, I've got down here a number of testimonies. I didn't bring them up, but people whose uh, pelvic uh, bones were healed. I had one guy come up and talk about that he was uh, driving down the road and he was 50% 
deafness and his ears were opened and on and on and on and on you could go and all of these things, you have a part in every bit of that. When we get to heaven, nobody is going to think, I wish I'd have had more, you know, toys, more this. I'd have had my fifth flat screen TV that I'd have had a nicer car. After all of this stuff is gone, the only thing that lasts is the way that you impact people's lives. And you are going to have people come up and thank you for your partnership, the way that you've invested in the kingdom. And I guarantee you, uh, we're going to see things from a totally different light. And it's to our benefit to see it now so that we can use our resources and get involved. You know, uh, they've already passed these things by. We aren't receiving another offering. So I'm not sharing this for any purpose except for your benefit. But I went to... Um, uh, Merritt Island, Florida, many years ago when we were building a building down in Colorado Springs. And the pastor there, Dan Stahlbaum, uh, they had about 300 to 400 people in the church. And Dan Stahlbaum said that the Lord told him that he was supposed to give a $50,000 offering for me that week while I was there. Which that's just a huge offering compared to what I'd normally get. And he was praying and saying, God, how could our people give $50,000? And what he did was take a second uh, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, where it says, God gives seed to the sowers. And so he said, you may not feel like you can give uh, much money, but he says, I'm believing that there's 50 people among these three, 400 people that if God gave you $1,000 this week, would you give that $1,000 in this offering? So see, that was no risk. It said he gives seed to the sower. And so he says, if God doesn't give you any money, you don't have to put anything in the offering. But would there be 50 people here that would be willing to give $1,000 if God gives it to you? And so there was 50 people that stood up and made that commitment. And he taught them. And he says, God, you know, it's just like what Greg was teaching yesterday. God will never give you just enough. He'll give you seed to sow and bread to eat. He will always give you more. So uh, anyway, he got up and just challenged the people. That was on Sunday morning. By Sunday night, there was already half a dozen people that had had over $1,000 come to him that day. On Monday night, there was a man that got up and he already had $1,000 in his savings account and he was just going to take that 1000 out and go ahead and give it. His wife and him had already written the check out and they prayed over it before he went to work on Monday. And when he went into his job on Monday, his boss called him in and promoted him and gave him a $4,000 per month raise. And they started giving these testimonies. And did you know that other people started standing up and saying, well, I'll take this deal because you know what? And they gave more than $55,000 for a three-day meeting. Man, that's awesome. And in a sense, this is what Ashley was asking you to do to pray about it you know and so i just want to challenge you that there's some of you that want to give but if you you have to put your faith out there these things don't happen accidentally and if you don't make a deliberate uh step in this direction and do it intentionally then even if god was to prosper you you wouldn't even recognize why it came and stuff but some of you you just need to make a deliberate decision and say you know what father i'm i'm a sower you give me seed. You give me increase from some, like an unexpected inheritance, a job promotion, or, or just whatever it is. You, you bless me, and I guarantee you, I'm going to sow it into the kingdom. If you would do that, God would bless you. And like Greg was saying yesterday, man, you need to be stretching yourself. You need to be, be believing for more than just enough to get by. I'm constantly, Jamie and I are believing for increasing. We got everything we need. Our house is paid for. Our cars are paid for. When we go buy a car, we always buy cash. We, we don't need anything, and yet we're always believing for something so that we can give more. Amen. 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 So there's some great, great lessons in all of this. I just want to say that I've had a great time. I have really enjoyed this. It's ministered to me. I appreciate Barry and Greg. Boy, they have been a blessing, and I appreciate your attitude. I tell you, you guys are fired up. It has been fun to worship the Lord with all of these guys who are so excited about the Lord. So it's just been great, and I believe that God is doing something miraculous in people's lives. 
I believe that when you go back home, your family, that I was standing there at my dad's funeral and I was sitting on the front row and he was in a casket just right in front of me, just a few feet in front of me. And that was his favorite song. And so they were singing, How Great Thou Art. And I remember as a 12-year-old kid thinking that this just doesn't compute. Here's my dad dying, and yet we're talking about how great God was. I prayed for six months that he'd be healed, and he wasn't healed. And I remember praying right then and saying, Father, if you're really great, then show me what your purpose for my life is. Do something with my life. Reveal yourself to me. And I really believe that that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. I got born again when I was eight years old. This was four years later. But when I was 12 and I prayed that prayer, God answered that prayer. And I never hear that song that I don't think about what God has done in the last 54, 55 years uh, and what he's done in my life. And if God will do that for me, a 12-year-old kid, man, what would he do for any person in here? God wants to move in our life. God has a plan for you that is better than your plans for yourself. Well, Lamont said that this morning about God has treated him better than he treats himself. I thought that's a great way of saying it. But man, look how you've treated yourself. Go get drunk, shoot something up that hurts you and cost you money and causes all kinds of pain and suffering. God would never do that to you. God treats you better than you treat yourself. His plans for you are all good. Man, it's awesome. But we have to cooperate. And this is what I've been talking about is having a spirit of excellence. You know what Barry shared this morning is a totally different terminology and different stuff, but it's talking about the same stuff. And uh, he specifically was making the difference between imitation and revelation are, um, those were some of the terminology. I hope I don't mess your deal up. If I do, you can tell me. But he was, he was talking about how we imitate people, but how we have to have our own revelation from God and stuff. Here's another way of saying that is, on the positive side, that you might see somebody who's doing the right thing. And here we've been talking, I've been talking all of this week about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And some of you might have been motivated to imitate their stand and to be bold and to do all of these things. But you need a revelation of why they did what they did. In other words, you don't just copy a person's actions, but why does a person act the way that they do? Once you can catch their heart and why they were the way that they were, that's how you get set free. So the very first thing I started talking about is you have to know who you are. You have an excellent spirit on the inside of you. And if you ever got a glimpse of who you are and what you really have in Christ Jesus, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be settled for, you wouldn't settle for mediocrity unless. You need to get a revelation of who you are. If you don't have my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, you ought to get that. That's the thing that transformed my life. And part of their thing, the second thing was that they were just courageous. They wouldn't compromise. They wouldn't change anything. And boy, we've got to get to where we do not compromise. When this world is trying to force us to compromise and tell us to be quiet, we've got to believe and we've got to stand up. What I talked about last night was how that Daniel was not only convicted and courageous, but he displayed it publicly. And I showed you that there were scriptural precedent for civil disobedience that we need to stand up and we need to stand against this culture for godly, righteous things. What I want to do to this morning, and I've only got 30 minutes left, uh, but what I want to do in this short time is just share with you kind of why they did what they did. And I haven't got time to go through and, and show you all of these things in the book of Daniel, but I want to emphasize humility is a huge part of this. And you can approach this from a thousand different directions, but to me, one of the greatest characteristics of humility is that you put God and other people, what he has called you to do, ahead of yourself. That's humility. And if you see these other things about how God wants you to make a difference, but if you go out and try and do it in your own strength, I can guarantee you when they threaten you, when they persecute you and say they're going to do this to you, if self is still the dominant thing, if you love yourself more than you love God and, and more than you love what he's called you to do, you'll compromise every single time. 
It's just kind of like, you know, whatever is the most important to you is what you will always promote and defend. And you need to reach a place where you are not the most important in your life. These are, those are big statements, bold statements. Look over here in Proverbs chapter 15. Let me just share some scriptures with you. Proverbs 15, 33, it says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. We've talked about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how they prospered and that God promoted them and they rose to be over millions and millions of people because there was an excellent spirit in them. I can guarantee you a large part of that, what made them able to do that is because before honor is humility. God isn't going to promote you if it's all about you. This is something that people have a hard time understanding, but... The Lord, because he loves other people and because he loves you, it's God that's holding some of you back. And some of you think, well, I thought God was a good God. He is a good God. But he doesn't want to put you in a position of leadership if you're going to wind up hurting and abusing people. And this is what selfish people do. This is what people who are all wrapped up in themselves do. They hurt people. And he loves you so much. If, if God puts you into a position of leadership, if it's godly leadership, I guarantee you, you just had a huge target drawn on your back. Satan is going to fight against you. I talked about that some yesterday, that if you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. When God begins to start l putting you up and putting you in a position of leadership, people are going to criticize you. And if you are a selfish person that is in love with yourself and you have to have the acclaim and the validation of other people for you to feel good, then you'll be destroyed by the criticism and by the persecution. You know, I was in a minister's conference in Greeley, Colorado, and Across the front, there must have been 50 people. I was speaking in a minister's conference, and I spoke, I forgot now what I spoke on, but there was about 50 people that came forward for prayer. And I started down at this end, and there was a guy standing on the very end, and I just skipped him. And I started with the second guy, and I went down the row, and I prayed with every one of them. And when I got down to the other end, this guy had gotten back in line, and had gotten down here because I didn't pray for him. You were at this, Daniel. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about or not, but... Anyway, he was down at this end. So when I got down there, I just quit before I got to him. And anyway, this guy grabbed me by the arm and says, why won't you pray for me? And I said, you don't want me to pray for you. And he says, yes, I do. I want you to pray for me. And I said, are you willing to take whatever God gives you? And he said, yeah. So anyway, I prayed and I said, you've been rebuking and wondering why your ministry doesn't open up. And I said, it's God that stopped your ministry. Because he doesn't want you to hurt other people. And he doesn't want you to get hurt. And I'd never seen the man before, but I just knew these things. And I said, it's God that's hindering your ministry because he loves you and he loves other people. And anyway, I didn't know any of the details. Later, during that meeting, I sat down and talked to him. And he had been a homosexual. And he had just been born again, just, a, I mean, a short period of time, months. And he was wanting to go out and just reach all the homosexual community. You know, the desire was good, but he wasn't ready yet. And if he would have been in ministry, it would have been premature. He would have hurt people. He wouldn't have presented it in the proper uh, attitude. And he would have been overcome. And anyway, this guy, finally, we sat down and talked. And years later, he came to me and he says, you know, that was God. I realize now I wasn't ready. But he still kicked the doors down, got into ministry too quickly, and after just a few years of being in a ministry to homosexuals, he wound up being hurt by the persecution, and he's totally renounced the Lord, quit serving the Lord, out of the ministry and everything. And you know what? It was God that was holding him back because God cared more about him than just using him and seeing him destroyed and thrown to the side. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but before honor is humility. Before God can really promote you, you've got to have the right attitude. And you've got to realize there's something more important than you. There are things that are bigger than you. What God has called you to do and the way it touches other people is more important than whether or not you benefit from it. You know, one of the things, and, and no, we aren't perfect here. I'm not trying to present that. But one of the things that's working well here and that we're doing good is that there's not jealousy among all of these speakers and stuff. You know, the musicians, 
Paul Milligan leaned over to me this morning and looked at this front line, Daniel and Greg and, uh, man, I just went blank, <laughs> Matthew, Matthew and then Lamont and all of these guys and Marcus, and he says, look at this lineup. It's miraculous. They, we, these are some of the best singers, ministers on the planet, and they're just all standing here, and you know what? There's no competition. And we're here to glorify the Lord, and we don't have to be the one that everybody gets top billing. You know what that is? That's humility. And it's one of the reasons that things are working the way they're working is because I'm not jealous of Barry. Man, I praise God that people like Barry more than me. Amen? That's just great because I chose him. So I get credit. Amen? I don't mind that people like Greg more than me and stuff. I just think that this is great. And there's just, there's not this competition. If you get promoted and don't have these things worked out, pride would kill you. The Bible says in James chapter 3, verse 16, where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. You open up a door to anything the devil wants to do when you are in strife and in pride. And if you're one that if God was to promote you and you were to begin to start taking credit for it, Satan would eat your lunch and pop your bag if you take all of this for yourself. Jesus said that I am meek and lowly in heart. That is his nature and character. And as long as we are still thinking about ourselves and promoting ourselves, you just... Uh, insulate yourself from being used of God. Man, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these guys were willing to lay their life down and give their life and die if that's what it took. It wasn't all about themselves. Man, that's powerful. Over here, let me just read another verse. says the same thing in chapter 18, in verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Same thing. Chapter 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And we talked about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were promoted to riches and honor and all of these things. And it says before that happens, there has to be humility. Brothers, we have presented a some things in front of you this week that are good and if you go out and just try and imitate it and follow those things but you don't have the same heart of humility that allowed it and allowed these things to happen you're going to lead to frustration and failure as Barry was teaching you need to get the same heart these men had a commitment they loved God more than they loved themselves you can talk about humility from a thousand different angles but you know what it is it's really seeking first the kingdom of God it's loving God more than you love yourself it's putting God first what would the Lord want you to do what is God's will for you we have people all the time that say God's telling me to come to school but and then they give all of the reasons and I just I just can't understand if you know God told you to do something why would you Put any but in there. You just do what God tells you to do. Well, but, I had a guy say one time, but, but I'm living under a bridge. I don't even have a place to sleep. I said, we got bridges out here. <laughs> we had people say, I, I'd like to come, but I got two dogs. We said, we have dogs out here. Bring your dogs. It's just amazing. If God tells you to do something, you just do it. You know what that is? That's humility. You just get to the place to where God knows better than you do. God's smarter than you are. Look over here in James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and in verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Did you know that God is gracious? But there are varying degrees of grace. There is grace for salvation. 
There are graces for these different gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Over in Romans chapter 12, it talks about prophesy according to the proportion of, of faith that's given unto you. God gives varying degrees of graces, and right here it says he gives more grace. Man, grace is important. Well, wouldn't you like to have more grace? Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Did you know if you are proud, and again, pride can be defined in many ways, but if you are always focused on yourself, if it's always about promoting yourself, if God tells you to go this way, but you think this way would benefit you more, you know what that is? That's pride. That's self. And God resists the proud. The word resist here means to actively fight against. It's not that God doesn't love you. But God is a meek and lowly God. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. How can two walk together except they be agreed? If you are always thinking about yourself and promoting yourself, you cannot really walk closely with the Lord. Look on down here. It goes on to say, it says, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. This isn't a separate thought. How do you draw nigh to God? Through hum humility, through putting God first, through putting other people first. When you exalt yourself, it actually pushes God away. Keep your finger here, but look back in Psalms 138. And in verse 6, it says, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You want to draw nigh to God? He knows the proud afar off. You'll never get nigh to God. You will never have the relationship and the things that you desire as long as it's all about you, as long as you're going to use God to promote yourself. It hinders God. He knows the proud afar off. He resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Let me share another passage over here in 1 Peter chapter 5. This is basically the same thing, but a different author writing it. 1 Peter chapter 5, and in verse 5 it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, Yea, all of you be subject to one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Here's two witnesses in the New Testament, and actually this is a quotation from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34. And so here's three times in Scripture that it says that God resists the proud. Again, he doesn't resist you in the sense that he hates you or dislikes you, but God resists that pride. That, Pride is an expression of the devil. I don't know if you knew this, but there was no pride before Satan. Satan said in Isaiah chapter 14, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. You know what that was pride? That was pride. He was exalting himself and it originated with the devil. Man, if I had time, I'm talking as fast as I can. But if I had time, you could go on and show that all lying is a result of pride. Satan is the author of all lies. John chapter 8, verse 44. He's the father of it. Any time a person speaks a lie, any time you exaggerate, any time you try and make things look better to make yourself look better. You know, among preachers, it's like, how many were there at the men's advance? Oh, there were thousands. When, you know, there's like 800 or 900 or whatever it is that we've got. But, you know, you evangelistically, you just expand it and stuff. You know what that is? That's lying. And you know what it all comes from is an insecurity, a desire for people to feel good about you. And so you will manipulate, you will say things that present you in a better light. It's all about you. It's all about self. You take a person who is dead to themselves and they will not lie, they will not exaggerate, prove things, embellish things. They don't have to toot their own horn. You know, my dad used to jokingly say, he that tooteth not his own horn, the same shall not be tooted. And that was, I thought that was scripture until after he was dead and I went to looking for it and found out that wasn't in the Bible. 
But there's a lot of people that believe that, that you have to promote yourself. But God says he would promote you. It says in Psalms chapter 75, I believe it is, 76 or somewhere right along there. Promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west or from the south, but it's the Lord that puts up one and sets down another. You don't have to promote yourself. Somebody says, well, if I don't promote myself, if I didn't do these things, who would do it? God if you would humble yourself. But when you are promoting yourself, when you are pushing yourself, when you are exaggerating things and overstating it and doing these things to make yourself look better, you eliminate God's promotion. God doesn't promote that. He said, my glory will I not share with another. As long as you are taking the good things that God has done in your life and you are presenting it and you are receiving the glory for it, it hinders God. And it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, What do you have that you haven't received? And if you've received it, then why do you glory as if you haven't received it? Why are you acting as if it's yours? You know, some of you in here are very talented in all kinds of things, and you can work with metal, you can work with wood, you can build things, you can do machinery, you, you just can, you, you know, you've got all of these different talents represented in this room. But the truth is, God's the one that gave every one of you whatever talents you've got. It's God that gave them to you. And you may not recognize, and you say, oh no, I went to school. I've worked hard. I've studied. You can't develop what God didn't put in there. You know what? You know, I can sing. I can carry a tune. I like the way I sing, but I'll, I'm just never going to sing like Matthew, like Daniel. These guys, they've got a gift. They've got an anointing that I don't have. And it's, it's a gifting from God. It's an ability from God. Now, they do things to develop it, but it's a gifting. Your, your abilities are gifts from God, whether you recognize it or not. And the person that God will flow through is a person that will give all of the glory to God and not take it for themselves. But God is not going to promote you if you're promoting yourself. Amen or oh me. And I'm telling you, this is one of the things I believe that really describes a person with an excellent spirit is a person who recognizes that it's God, that they're humble, that they give God the credit, that they submit themselves. They put God ahead of themselves. And if their decrease will benefit the kingdom of God, then let it be so. Amen. If somebody can run this ministry better than I can, praise God, we'll let them have it. You know, if God told me to go to Africa and, and live in a grass hut and minister to those people, and if I knew for sure that was God, I'd be glad to lay this down and let somebody have everything we got and walk off. My relationship is all about God and what God wants me to do, and this is what God wants me to do, and so I'm committed to it, I'm focused on it, but if he wanted me to do something else, I could walk off and let somebody else do it. You need to evaluate some things, and you need to humble yourself. And to me, this, this is what um, Barry was talking about this morning. Don't just come in here and try and imitate what you see these people in Scripture doing and stuff, but why were they able to do things? Because you know what? They had put God first in their life. They were willing to suffer, to die, to do whatever. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to get to a place to where you love God more than you love yourself. And I tell you, that is, that is really the heart of this excellent spirit, is living to where you're living for God, you aren't living for yourself. It's not all about yourself. If I had more time, I could share with you like Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride comes contention. Only. And yet there's some people that say, oh, no, my whole family, I mean, it's just in our genes. That's not what the Bible says. The only thing that makes you angry is your selfishness. It's just the fact that you're focused on yourself. If you're, a, if you're an angry man, if you fly off the handle and stuff like this, you may relate it to, well, it's what this person did to me. No, it's, what, it's what's on the inside of you. You could take a corpse up here and spit on the corpse, kick the corpse, Ignore the corpse, insult the corpse, and if it's a corpse, it wouldn't respond. If you're dead to yourself, you can literally get to a place, it doesn't matter what your wife's doing, what your boss is doing, and stuff like that. 
I know that some of these things I'm saying just saying this is impossible. You don't even know what you're talking about. Well, don't wake me up. This is how I'm living, and I'm telling you, I've had people do things to me, accuse me, lie about me, slander me, and in a week's time, I totally have forgotten it. People have to remind me that they've done it because I just don't... It, you can't get into anger and into strife without being a selfish, self-centered person thinking about yourself. It is not your genes, it's your pride and your selfishness. You need to get that book, not for your wife, but for yourself on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. You know, I had a man that come up to me in Tulsa and he listened to that tape as he was driving to a divorce proceeding. He and his wife were getting a divorce. And he listened to that teaching on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. And man, he pulled off the road. God spoke to him, changed his life. He shared it with his wife. And for the last 20 years, they have been teaching marriage seminars all around the country and seeing people's lives get changed. This is something that will affect you in every area of your life. In giving, there's a lot of people, well, I'd like to give, but I, you just don't understand. I just don't have the money to give. You know what that really is? It's pride. And somebody think, well, no, it has nothing to do with pride. I don't have any money. Again, you are looking only at your resources. You aren't submitted unto God. You are trusting your wisdom, and you're thinking you know better than God. If you would just humble yourself and say, God, I... It looks like the death of me if I do this. But you know what? You're God. I'm not. You said to give, and so I'm going to follow you. That's humility. If you did it, God would prosper you every single time. Self-centeredness, pride, is the source of all of your problems. It's the source of your depression. You can't be depressed without being a selfish, self-centered person. Amen. Some of you didn't understand that one, but that's absolutely true. If you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. And brothers, this is why some of you aren't being promoted. It's why marriage isn't going good. It's why finances aren't going good. It's why you suffer depression, discouragement. It's why you're intimidated and all of these kind of things. And it's just because you love yourself. You are the center of your universe and you need to change. We need to come to a place where we put God and other people first. And man, I've had a very short time to say these things today. I haven't gone into a lot of detail, but hopefully the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. And there's some of you that just need to make a decision that you aren't going to be the Lord of your life anymore, that you're going to get off the throne and you're going to let God occupy that position. Amen. You know, every one of us need improvement in this. You never just nail it. And you get it, and you never have another problem. If anybody says, oh, man, I died to myself 20 years ago, and I've never had a problem since, they've never died to themselves. <laughs> the only way you're going to ever get rid of self is if you come up here and we'll just kill you, and you go home to be with Jesus, and then you won't be selfish anymore. But as long as you're in this life, you're going to have to be dealing with self. And so all of us need to improve in this constantly. You just never totally get it figured out. But I'm convinced that there's some people here today that God is speaking to and you realize that, man, I, all I'm going to be able to do is to imitate until I get my heart changed, until I humble myself and I get, you know, by revelation that God shows me that he's God, I'm not, and you bow the knee. So I want to give an invitation and I want to pray with you if you're one that has never really done this, if you right now would just say, you know what, I, my whole life has been all about myself and that this is revelation to me and today I want to commit myself to walking humbly with God, to humbling myself, putting God and other people, putting your wife, your children first. If, if this is new for you and you're... You need to make that commitment. I want to ask you right where you are just to stand and I'm going to lead you in prayer and we're going to make this commitment and I believe this is going to make a difference in your life. If that's you, just stand right where you are. All right, I'm going to pray for you and I believe that God's going to do a miracle in your life. Amen.
The Bible says that we have to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. It says we have to humble ourselves. If it's done to you, it's not humility, it's humiliation. Humility has to be voluntary. If it's imposed upon you, it's humiliation. So we are going to humble ourselves. And you've already humbled yourself by standing in front of your brothers and just acknowledging that you've got a problem in this area. And this is the beginning of you beginning to put God ahead of yourself and not exalting yourself. So, Father, I pray for all of my brothers right now. And I thank you, Father. Thank you for the awesome things that you've done in our life. Thank you, Father, that you are so worthy to be praised that we can exalt you and put you first. And if we seek first the kingdom of God, all of these other things will be added unto us. Father, we believe that you love us more than we love ourselves, that you'll treat us better than we'll treat ourselves. So, Father, we want to put you first. We want you to be the center of our life. We want you to control us. Father, we want to love you so much that if standing up for you cost us something, we wouldn't even acknowledge it. Father, we would just be concerned with putting your kingdom first and glorifying you. So we lay ourselves on the altar right now. We make ourselves a living sacrifice before you. You know, as I'm saying this in your heart, you need to be praying to the Lord right now. And you need to say, God, I just commit it all to you. God, take away. I give you rights to come into my life and show me areas where I'm selfish, where I'm promoting myself, where I've not honored my wife, I've not honored my children, I've not honored other people. Father, I just give you right to every part of my life, to every room in my life. I want you to come in and take control. I want to live for you. I want to be completely submitted to you, Father. We make this commitment right now. We lay ourselves on the altar and Holy Spirit, we ask for your fire to fall right now. We ask for your power to fall on us, Heavenly Father, and just consume the sacrifice to burn up all of the dross, all of the junk that's on the inside of us. And Father, we thank you. We believe that you are faithful and just to keep that which we commit. And we believe that from today on, that, Father, there's going to be a change in us as you begin to work yourself through us and there becomes more of you and less of us. Father, we believe that this change begins today.